And brethren, you can see from that what talented students we have at Foundation Institute this year. I didn't know that Caleb spoke Italian. <laughs> Very nice music. The problem with giving a sermon after special music like that is that the speaker doesn't feel like getting up. He feels mellow, just like everybody else. So we have a mellow moment for the first 30 seconds. And anyway, thank you very much. That was very fine special music. We appreciated it. Uh, we had a lot of um, prayer requests during the announcement uh, section. I'd just like to add one that we've talked about a little bit. Let's please keep in our prayers the, this horrible situation in the Philippines. I don't know that we've had any news come into the office yet. But uh, we do, of course, have brethren there. And the, the word in the, in the news was that this hurricane or typhoon was four or five times stronger than Hurricane Katrina, the one that hit the coast of uh, Louisiana a number of years ago. So uh, if you check the news this morning, either on internet or TV or whatever, you can see the destructive force. It really looks very, very serious. And uh, there's one at Tacloban, I think, in the Philippines. The city was pretty well wiped out. They're talking about over 1,000 dead, but that's my guess is that that's a very low estimate. They're uh, going to find a large, much larger number of people who've lost their lives uh, over the next few days. So uh, I think it's important for us to keep that in our prayers and especially for our brothers and sisters that God would provide for them in those difficult, difficult circumstances. When there's no food uh, easily available and no fresh water and no communications, these things can be very very dangerous and very trying. Well, uh, Foundation Institute is going well. I think you have pretty well uh, all of the news from the office. There's not that much that I can add, frankly, but uh, the news gets out well, get very well communicated these days. Uh, FI is going well. I, I think we're doing fine. Uh, we have, of course, uh, Thanksgiving approaching in two and a half weeks, and we've got a little bit of a scattering with students going here and there and several of them staying here. Uh, uh, Jerry uh, Lind has uh, kindly invited a number of students over to her home. She probably doesn't want, want me to mention her name at all, but I just did. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. We appreciate that. And um, I think everyone is taken care of, actually, so we're all looking forward to Thanksgiving coming up shortly. Uh, the week was very busy in the office. The office was, office was humming Tuesday through Thursday with the strategic planning meetings going on. And uh, I've, uh, some of that has come out, the results of some of that. I think some good things will result from that and some new direction for the church as we approach three years since this body of God's people came into existence. Uh, next month, December, of course, we have the uh, uh, ministerial board of directors coming in and the strategic plan and uh, budget and operation plans will be approved and finalized. And of course, at the end of December, almost everybody is going to Louisville, Kentucky. I say almost because I'm not. I'm going where it's even colder. I'm going to Portland, Oregon, but the Louisville uh, event does look pretty exciting this year, so if any of you are going to go, I think you'll enjoy it. Portland will be, will be good as well. Mr. Register mentioned something to me over the phone about uh, skiing or uh, 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 snowboarding or something of that nature. I don't know what I'm going to try. We'll see uh, how it goes when I get out there. One of the conversations I had in the office this week was with Dave Myers, whom you probably know. Uh, he is uh, involved with our, uh, the younger uh, portion of our educational programs. And, uh, you know, he's always got a good sense of humor and uh, enjoyed talking with him. I commented um, that last time, a number of, about three years when I saw, saw him um, in different circumstances, that I, th I thought from that point until now, he had a little bit less hair on his head. And being the good-natured person that he is, he laughed about it. And then he told me that when he goes into Starbucks these days, he and his wife, that they're the oldest people there. And the employees of Starbucks sometimes raise their voices, assuming that the hearing is going. <laughs> <laughs> and he's one of our young ministers. I looked around at the ministerial conference that we had back in June and saw a number of veterans, many highly respected men and women who served God's church for a long time, years and decades, and we also saw rather a lot of gray hair. This is a challenge that, of course, the church is well aware of. Um, we uh, do need in God's church and in the Church of God, a worldwide association, continuity of leadership. The administration is well aware of that, and I think you're aware of the focus mentoring program, out of which there have actually been two hires so far, Mr. Sanderlands, Mr. and Mrs. Sanderlands, whom you knew very well here and served in this area for many years and now over in uh, New Orleans and 
Uh, Larry Lambert has been hired and will be reassigned shortly. There are six ongoing, still in the program, out of this year's program, and there are 10 candidate couples that have been nominated for next year. Uh, the continuity of leadership is the subject that I'd like to talk about this afternoon. Let's begin in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Though that's actually not the title of the sermon. We'll get to that shortly. Matthew 9 verses 36 through 38. A scripture that I think we've read before. But let's look at what Jesus said here. Matthew 9, verse 36, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd are a very sad sight, and something that, uh, if possible, certainly we wish to not have happen. Verse 37, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And uh, I believe that we as a church are committed to that. We uh, desire that God's people would be pastored wherever they may be. The evidence of that is that ministers travel many different places where there are little groups and small congregations and so on. It's uh, the desire of the church and the administration, I believe, to take good care of God's people. But how is this to be accomplished? over the next months and years. Uh, the title of the sermon is going to be From Generation to Generation. I was looking for a good title and I remembered one of the, the scriptures use this term, the Hebrew Old Testament, Lador Vador, and I even remember it being read, I wasn't very good in synagogue attendance when I was a kid, but I can remember it being read in some of the prayers in the synagogue. From Generation to Generation. And as I got to thinking about this, I realized how many transitions there are in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is full of transitions. Moses to Joshua, fascinating transition. You've got the great lawgiver, and as the Bible tells us, he was also a prophet. Moses, a towering personality in the Bible, the one through whom God gave most of the law. And then down to Joshua, the leader of God's people, when they entered the promised land. A, another example, not such a happy example, a negative example that we'll refer to shortly, Saul to David. Saul, of course, the first king of Israel uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, and then David, the starting point of the Davidic dynasty from the tribe of Judah, the line from which eventually Jesus Christ, the Savior, would come. And we heard a little bit of reference in the sermonette to the transition from David to Solomon. All of these transitions are fascinating. And all of them hold lessons for us today. Elijah, the great prophet, the one about whom there is a very famous prophecy right at the end of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. And of course, the transition to Elisha. Also a very, very interesting transition. I think any one of these is probably enough to build an entire sermon around because there's so much going on inside each one of those transitions. And one other that should bears mentioning, although there are more, the transition from John the Baptist to Jesus Christ. Also a fascinating one because, of course, you go from a regular human being, prophet, servant of God, to Jesus Christ, the Savior of God's people, the Savior of the world, of course, and a very interesting transition that takes place at that point, a little bit complicated in some ways. But the starting point for this whole subject of continuity of leadership and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, training of new generations to look after God's people is uh, are things that we've talked about before. Working together, of course, is very important as the church fulfills its function and desires to provide new leadership for God's people as the years go by. Mr. Johnson has a poster on his wall, which I've noticed every now and then when I've been in the, his office. It's a big, colorful poster with teamwork written there. And I thought how apropos that is, teamwork. We work together as a team. There are many different metaphors we could use to depict this. Sometimes the term family is used as well. I heard somebody say a number of years ago, there's no M-E in the word family. There, is, there are letters me in the word teamwork. And I'm, I'm not sure that that necessarily means we should never talk about teamwork. 
But certainly, we need to work together. God's church must work in harmony, in concert together, and especially in this area of continuity of leadership. It was Ralph Waldo Emerson, a rather famous quote. He said the following, I expect you've heard this. He said, there is no limit to what can be accomplished if it doesn't matter who gets the credit. Isn't that wonderful? It's true, isn't it? There's no limit to what can be accomplished if it doesn't matter who gets the credit. We know from the scriptures that what we do in the household of God, ultimately Jesus Christ gets the credit. He's the one who gives the power and the ability and the training and all of those things that make it possible for us to do his work. We in God's church have to pull together and work together with all of the various ages and age groups that we have in the church today. That presents, of course, some challenges. It also presents some wonderful opportunities. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses beginning in verse 4. I've got in my notes verses 4 through 11, but I don't know that I want to read all of that. Let's begin in 1 Corinthians 3, beginning here in verse 4. The Apostle Paul was well aware of that concept. I'm sure he not, obviously not heard Ralph Waldo Emerson's a statement, but I'm sure he would have been in agreement with it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 4, for when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? They were lining up behind different human leaders in competition with one another in Corinth. Verse 5, who is Paul? The Greek actually says, what is Paul? Who is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed? as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Paul writes, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Years ago, I heard a sermon around a very similar subject, and the title of the sermon was Added Value. Added Value, and I think it's a good way of depicting how things work in God's church. Verse 7, so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. It is, of course, God who called every one of us, put us in the church, and ultimately he's the one who trains us and prepares us. He has human beings who serve and, do, uh, and cooperate with that purpose, but we are no more than that. Verse 8, now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Lots of images there, the image of a temple. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I think this is a principle that church pastors understand. Pastors move around from time to time, new approaches, new personalities. Of course, the foundation is the same, Jesus Christ and the doctrine of Jesus Christ. John chapter 4, John chapter 4, verses 37 and 38. John 4, verses 37 and 38. Same concept. The concept, of course, is that human personalities are of much less significance than Jesus Christ himself and God the Father and what they're doing. John 4, verse 37 red letters in my Bible, probably in yours as well, for in this, this saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. So the basic scriptural principle that I think we all understand, but it's good for us to remind ourselves of this, is that we all work together. We work together in harmony and cooperation, everyone having different responsibilities, of course, but we work together recognizing that everything that's done in the church ultimately is done by Jesus Christ, and we're to be in harmony with him following his lead. Uh, someone you've probably not even heard of, but he was one of my favorite singers when I was a kid back in England, uh, a man by the name of Cliff Richard. He's uh, well up in years now. I won't ask for a show of hands. When he first came onto the scene in England, he was regarded as England's answer to Elvis Presley, but he never got big here in the United States. He's, uh, he's recorded lots of records and he's still there. He's still, I still see him on TV when I go back to England every now and then. Cliff Richard, he's changed a lot over the years. Uh, but I remember a, uh, a song that I had on one of those old vinyl albums 
and it was by Cliff Richard and the Shadows. And the line in the song, which I think was a beautiful line and very much, uh, uh, very significant and germane to where we are in God's church today, he, uh, Cliff Richard sang, it takes youth and experience to really win the fight. It takes youth and experience to really win the fight. Uh, the brochure of our ministerial conference this year, you may have seen it, actually had an illustration on the front and it showed somebody carrying a baton. And of course, this was to evoke a particular image, the image of a relay race. How is this all carried out? How is leadership passed on? What are the responsibilities of younger people? What are the responsibilities, uh, responsibilities of older people in this whole business of uh, going from generation to generation, preparing new leadership, making sure the people of God are always served? Um, were you a runner? I was never much of a runner. I used to go out and jog when I lived in Southern California. I can remember doing, uh, as we used to call them, cross-country runs as a kid back in England. I almost always came in last or second to last. I think I've done a relay race maybe once or twice in my life. But relay races are really kind of interesting things. And they're not nearly quite as simple as one would think looking at it from the outside. You have to get the relay race right. I found this on the internet. I was reading about uh, how relay races work. This is from jmlalonde.com, article, Passing the Leadership Baton. Uh, he says, uh, think of leadership as a relay race. You're the first in a line of runners. The baton is firmly in your hand. You're running the race and picking up steam. You've just hit your stride, and now it's time to pass the baton. This is the point a relay runner enters the exchange zone. This apparently is very important. Probably some of you are much more conversant with this than I, but the exchange zone is very important. It's a time and distance sensitive area. Once you enter this zone, you have a certain amount of time to make a clean handoff. Do it too early or too late, and the next runner falters. Go too far or not far enough, and the other runner misses the baton. Leadership requires correct timing and passing of the baton. You don't want to pass the baton too early. The next leader may not be ready for the responsibility. You don't want to pass the baton too late. You don't want to overstay your welcome in leadership, that particular article says. And you know, when you watch the passing of the baton in a relay race, you notice that the next runner begins to run before they have received the baton. You sort of try to harmonize the speed together. And of course, it's very important not to drop the baton. There's an art to a relay race. There's an art to the training and uh, preparation of leadership for serving God's people. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11 through 13. In spiritual terms, what does this mean? 1 Corinthians 12, verses 11 through 13. In spiritual terms, we must run at the same pace. And as the Apostle Paul emphasizes here, what we need is spiritual harmony. What must be is spiritual harmony. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 11, Paul writes, but he's talking about spiritual gifts here. I just find it interesting, whenever the Apostle Paul wrote about spiritual gifts, where did he place the emphasis? I'm not going to take the time to go through this chapter and the other chapter in Romans that talks about spiritual gifts. There's a lot there. But the emphasis is always what's for the benefit of the church. You almost get the impression that as Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he's discouraging them from some of the ostentation and some of the spiritual pride that some of them had in speaking in tongues and, and one thing and another. They seem to be too individualistic. Paul says to them something that we need to understand in relation to this subject, the preparing of leadership. No, everything that's done in the church must be for the benefit of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, Paul writes, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. I think there are people in other religions who misunderstand this, who think that spiritual gifts are there for ostentation and to prove somebody more spiritual than others and for, for show, and one thing and another. No, the emphasis in the New Testament is on the fact that if you've got an ability to do something, you do it for the benefit of the church. Verse 12, 
For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. And then verse 13, and this is where I'd like to place the emphasis. For by one spirit, we, are, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we've all been made to drink into one spirit. One spirit, the same spirit. Historically, the contention was Jews and Gentiles. Um, for us, these days, sometimes we talk about, you know, uh, the old and the young, and we see that we tend to think differently, and uh, we, uh, we, we, we learn differently, and we talk a great deal about gener Generation X and Generation Y and Generation Z and Generation whatever it may be. And if you think you're hearing the voice of somebody who thinks maybe that gets a little overplayed at times, yes, you'd be right, because it's true. We do learn differently. We have different ways of learning. I think the older among us probably were more auditory in the way they learned. Uh, I, I am. I'm an auditory learner. And others of you in, in this room are teachers as well. And you may identify with this. Younger people are more visual learners. And it's true. The, from generation to generation, the concerns are different. The approaches to politics are different. The way people learn is different. But for members of God's church and potential members of God's church, the important unifying factor is that we have one spirit and one doctrine. One spirit and one doctrine. This is essential. It unifies us. It minimizes some of the generational differences. It makes sure that we have steadiness and stability and that as leadership is passed from one person to another, that there is no choppiness. One of the things we don't want in God's church is choppiness. We've had too much of that, haven't we? In living memory of many of us who are here for services today. The goal is one spirit and harmonious transitions and movement from one group of people to another as God gives leadership. There's an interesting example that I'd like, like to take a look at back in the Old Testament. I'd like to turn back to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2 and look briefly at the Elijah-Elisha handover. 2 Kings chapter 2. I find it very, very interesting. Elijah was the mentor to Elisha. We've used the term mentoring in our leadership programs. Elijah was the mentor. You know, I think Elijah was a very big figure, larger than life. It was, of course, much later that the prophet Malachi was inspired to talk about this sort of latter-day fulfillment of Elijah, partly fulfilled in John the Baptist, and then apparently uh, at least one fulfillment after that. But even in his own lifetime, Elijah was a remarkable person in some of the things he did. He went through some very difficult times, but uh, in, uh, in opposing uh, ev evil Queen Jezebel and some of the rest he went through, you know, this made him quite some personality. So you've got Elisha and Elijah, his mentor, and Elisha knows that Elijah's time is ending and it's going to be Elisha's time. But let's notice a few details here. In 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. 2 Kings 2 verse 1. It came to pass when the Eternal was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Notice they're together. We don't know how much they talked about, but I can imagine, you, we can all imagine that there was a lot of conversation about his life and his experience and the things that he had learned. We'll revisit that briefly. I'm sure those conversations were very important to Elisha as he pre prepares to be the next prophet, following in the same spirit. Verse 2, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here please, for the Eternal has sent me to Bethel. Elisha's re reply, as the Eternal lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Uh, there's a tremendous example of dedication, uh, loyalty, as we heard in the sermonette. Elisha says, I'm sticking with you. I'm staying with you no matter what. Verse uh, 3, the sons of the prophets were, who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, don't you know the Eternal will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Verse 12. For Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Eternal has sent me on to Jericho. And again, the same refusal. As the Eternal lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. It's interesting, when you look at this example of Elisha, and we'll even look at the example of Joshua later on, you see an individual who begins with a steadfastness. 
who begins with loyalty, who begins with commitment. Doesn't it seem when you look at the entire picture of biblical leadership that these qualities precede technical knowledge of how to do things like preach and counsel and uh, work as a prophet or whatever it may be. He refuses to leave him. Verse, um, verse 6, same thing. Stay here, please, for the Eternal has sent me on to Jordan. And Elisha has the same response. Verse 9. No, let's not, let's not read, drop down to verse 9. Uh, let's pick it up in verse 8, because this is important. Now Elijah took this mantle, and he rolled it up, and he struck the water, and it was divided this way and that. So the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Look at this as a partnership, and they're walking side by side. And that mantle is going to become very important. Verse 9. And so it was when they crossed over that Elijah said, said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. It wasn't what Elijah expected. It wasn't, was it? Look at his re reaction. So he said, you've asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, so it shall, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. And it happened as they continued on the way, suddenly this famous chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Of course, that's much misinterpreted. He went up into the first heaven. But nevertheless, what you've got is Elisha staring at his mentor as this chariot of fire takes Elijah away from him. And he's stuck with him all the way through. Verses 12 and 13. Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. He saw him no more. Look at the relationship here between Elijah and Elisha, this close relationship. Did Elisha learn from Elijah? I'm sure he did. And he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them into two pieces. And then verse 13, and this is the detail that I, I'd like to focus on. He took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Now we can look at that and read right over it and say, okay, fine, a cloak. He puts on his cloak. But what does it mean? Actually, in biblical symbolism, to wear someone else's item of clothing is very significant. Uh, you may remember that uh, uh, Jonathan gave King David, king in waiting, a particular item of clothing elsewhere in the Bible. And even in the book of Esther, uh, we find that uh, when Mordecai is elevated, the king gives him certain items of clothing. Wearing someone's mantle means following the lead of that person, coming into the office of that person. Very symbolic, very important, and of course that is the way it should work in the church today. Verse 15, verse 15 in the same chapter. When the sons of the prophet who were from Jericho saw him, they said the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. The same spirit, the same spirit. And I checked on this because I'd heard it in the church years ago, and probably you have as well. And I checked on it this morning to make sure it's true. I didn't count them, but you've heard, and I believe this to be true, that once Elisha came into the office of Elijah, twice the miracle, twice the number of miracles was done. But it's interesting, they spend all this time together, and the mantle of Elijah then falls onto Elisha. What we're reading about here is spiritual harmony. Spiritually, they were from the same spirit. And when the request was a double portion, it was a double portion of the same spirit. It, leadership is effective if the mantle is moves. So as we look at this whole subject of leadership for God's church, that's very important. The same mantle must move from one to another, and the same spirit must go from one to another. Now I'd like to take a look at to the two sides of the story as we... As we, as we look at the practicalities of how this is done in the church today and the urgent need for new leadership, uh, how does all this work? And what are some of the responsibilities for younger leaders toward the older uh, veterans of the church and some of the responsibilities of the veterans toward the younger leaders? And there's a surprising amount of information about this in the Bible. Let's turn now to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. How can the younger can cooperate with the older to make sure that transitions 
this generation to generation process works well. You may, you may be aware of the fact that in years past at Ambassador College when the young men would come and uh, the leaders of the church would be very, very emphatic, you're not here to become ministers. And of course, there was a time when many of them were hired straight out of Ambassador College, but they had to sort of <laughs> do a kind of a masquerade and pretend they didn't want to be ministers because you weren't allowed to be a minister. It's interesting what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 on that subject. Uh, it's true that desiring to be a minister for the wrong reason is not a good thing, but um, uh, there are times when people desire to serve God's people for the right reasons. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and let's read verses 1 and 2. With this eye towards younger learning from the, el from the older. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Bishop or overseer, the word bishop is used here. Uh, it refers, it's the same as the, uh, it's synonymous with the term elder elsewhere. If somebody wants to be in that office, the work is good. Now, it doesn't say the desire itself is good or bad, but it says the work of a bishop is a good work. And then in verse 2, it goes on to say, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and apt to teach, able to teach. Now, as much it could be said about every one of those qualifications there, there's a lot there. But I'd like to stop briefly and, and focus on the last one in verse 2. Able to teach. In the old King James Version, it was apt to teach. That wonderful 1611 word. I kind of like the old King James wording at times a little bit more. Somebody who's able to teach. Very important qualification. Somebody who teaches well. We're going to keep on reading, but I want to make an observation here about something. That it doesn't stop there. The ability to teach is part of it, but it doesn't end there, and we have to read for the remainder of the story. Now, as you know, my work in the church has been mostly in education for quite a number of years. I began um, in the, on the Pasadena campus of Ambassador College and began doing a little bit of Bible teaching back then, and then when we all moved to uh, Big Sandy, I was transferred into the theology department, and uh, it was just a couple of years after I was ordained a local elder um, in the Worldwide Church of God and began teaching in the theology department for a few years and then taught for a number of years up in Cincinnati and uh, now for two years down here in Dallas at Foundation Institute. And teaching Bible is great. Teaching Bible is a wonderful thing to do. It can be very, very fulfilling and uh, I certainly hope that uh, uh, students have learned from all their teachers over the years. I believe that. Uh, certainly uh, students who are here recognize the word chesed, right? As quoted in the sermonette. Um, it's a word that I emphasize a great, a great deal in class. The point that I'm making here is that to understand the Bible is a necessary condition, a necessary qualification for serving in this role, but it's not the only one. It's very important. Let me explain to you why it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Knowing the Bible qualifies somebody, uh, some, apparently qualifies people for uh, teaching and being apt to teach. But there are things that you can't learn from simply knowing the Bible. There are other aspects to serving God's people. It's something I've seen over the years since most of my experience has been in education. And there are times that th things come up in serving the church and in serving God's people that are not explicitly covered in the scriptures. Basic principles may be there, but there are things that church pastors learn with experience that you can't necessarily learn by simply learning the Bible, or even by t teaching the Bible. Uh, the how-to of serving God's people, the how-to of pastoring, the how-to of being an elder or deacon or even a deaconess, those all the roles that we have in the church. And at times, we wonder, can the how-to be presented in the same way as understanding of the scriptures can be presented? Can you present pastoral skills and bottle them? and present them in seminars, up to a point, up to a point. But I've seen from my own experience, and hopefully I've learned a little bit about the Bible over all these years, uh, this is the 18th time I've taught the book of Isaiah. I've been through the book of Isaiah 18 times now. Uh, I was reflecting on it recently. I think four times at Ambassador College, 12 times when we were up in Cincinnati, and now twice 
down here in Dallas. So, you know, hopefully I've learned a little bit about the book of Isaiah. I'm sure there are many other, others in the church who understand aspects to it that maybe I have yet to learn. But you learn a great deal. But in times when I found myself in situations where our pastors find themselves on a regular basis, there have been occasions when I've said, you know, the how-to I may not understand in exactly the same way as I could express the meaning of a word like hesed or uh, some of the intricacies of the Old Testament. I was in Mr. Horchak's office just a few days ago and we were chatting about this and about a similar area and I thought Mr. Horchak made an interesting comment. Uh, he commented that when situations have come up as he's pastored uh, that he wasn't sure about, he said that he calls people. And I thought that's interesting. As Mr. Horchak has been in the ministry for quite some length of time, of course was uh, uh, serving in the ministry from his ambassador to college days and has pastored in many different areas. But he said, you know, he calls people. There are times when things come up that you can't learn in the same way as you learn what the Bible says, what a biblical text says. Let's keep on reading. I mentioned I wanted to keep reading here. Verse 6, perhaps together with verse 2, able to teach, and verse 6, a very important concept here, not a novice, not a neophyte, not somebody who's new to the faith, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Somebody can memorize the Bible. Somebody can stand up in front of people and talk about the Bible and even give good principles and say at times, here I am, I can do all of this. And there are occasions when God maybe, maybe will say, no, not so fast, not so fast. There are occasions, I've actually seen this occasionally, it's, it's not a good thing when it happens, when rapid promotion on the basis of Bible learning only, perhaps coupled with an ability to speak, leads to the wrong outcome. There are things that have to be learned about leadership of God's people that take time, they take humility, and they take experience. And there are people who are very good at memorizing scripture. They memorize it fast, they can express it, but the experience that has to be there in order to serve people effectively takes time and it takes humility. And I have to say that some of my most rewarding experiences in God's church have been times when I've simply sat and listened to veterans. I really enjoy that. You can learn a great deal from them. You sit and you sit, listen and you talk to somebody who served in God's church for longer than you and it's amazing what you can pick up. Pick up. It's sort of a vicarious learning. One of the qualities that tends to take time is good judgment. Good judgment takes time. Uh, some of you the know, things you can learn about judgment simply looking into the scriptures. There are things you learn about judgment out of experience and out of practice. I want to take another example here since we're talking about uh, transitions from leadership to leadership and take the example of Joshua. Let's go back to Exodus 33 and verse 11. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 11. Again, much we could say about Joshua and about the transition from Moses to Joshua. It's fascinating. The whole subject is fascinating. As you remember, Moses was denied entrance into the promised land because of a very serious mistake that he made uh, as through the book of Numbers at one particular point. Joshua was the one who came after Moses. But you learn interesting little details about this man, Joshua, uh, and about the way he developed. And I think this will illustrate the fact that good judgment takes time. How to deal with real situations takes time. Exodus 33, verse 11. Just one verse here. So the Eternal spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. That's quite a compliment. He spoke to him face to face. It says later on that with a prophet, God speaks to him in dark messages. But with Moses, he spoke face to face. Very intimate relationship. And he would return to the camp. And here's one of the early mentions of Joshua. But his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Notice this wonderful detail again, as I mentioned a few moments ago. Steadfastness, commitment, loyalty, as we heard in the sermonette, a starting point for leadership among God's people. Very important qualities, but not sufficient of them by themselves. More has to be added to it. And see, Joshua learned the tough way as well. Numbers chapter 11. 
Numbers 11, let's move forward because I think this illustrates something that we all go through when we're young. We lack judgment. We lack experience. We lack the ability to make good decisions. These things do take time. There's no way around it. Numbers 11, beginning in verse 26. Interesting thing going on. Poor old Moses struggling with his leadership role. Rebellion after rebellion after rebellion. He went through misery. And then this fascinating incident that again involves Joshua and tells us something. Numbers 11 and verse 26. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad. The name of the other one was Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. This was one of these occasions in the Old Testament when the Holy Spirit was given apparently temporarily for some kind of charismatic gift. Uh, now, this is not a, an, an advertisement for Pentecostalism, but let's keep reading. Now, they were among those listed, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ro- ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Now, notice what Joshua does here, and notice his poor judgment. Verse 28, so Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, who was in a prominent role, He answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Stop them. They're not supposed to be doing that. Verse 29, Moses, who had the experience and the better judgment, says to Joshua, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the eternal's people were prophets, and the eternal would put his spirit upon them all, (laughs) is what we're reading here. The point being from Moses, my job would be a whole lot easier because they would be much easier to work with. Just a little example of the fact that good judgment tends to come with age. Good judgment takes experience. I believe good judgment can be accelerated. We can learn good judgment by looking closely at the examples of people who have more experience than us. But there's no way around it. Good judgment takes time. And in the years that I've uh, had the privilege of working with young people, I've seen, it, I've seen this illustrated many times. It does take time. Sometimes we have good judgment. I have poor judgment uh, when I was in my 20s, I'm sure. But uh, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, young people in the church can be a little too black and white. And that black and white quality in dealing with human situations sometimes gets a little mitigated when you talk to pastors and you ask them, well, what do you do in a situation like this? And the pastor who's had decades of experience will tell you there's no one thing you do in a situation like this. Every example may be a little bit different. Judgment comes with experience. Another example in 1 Kings chapter 12. This is one of the reasons, by the way, I was chatting with Mr. Horchak about this. You know, when we hire someone, when we hire a man, he works with a more experienced pastor for some length of time and learns a lot, no doubt. 1 Kings chapter 12 And just a couple of things going on here. Here's another transition, but a bad one. This is the transition that, of course, led to the breakup of the nation of Israel. Solomon dies. Rehoboam ascends to the throne. And he's got a crisis on his hand right from the beginning, involving a man by the name of Jeroboam, who had served Solomon, rebelled against Solomon while Solomon himself was living. Jeroboam had to flee for his life. You can see that in chapter 11. Uh, He was exiled. He had political ambitions. And eventually he comes back and he foments this rebellion against Rehoboam. It's all a very interesting thing, and there's a lot to be said here, of course, because it was uh, was a, a complicated story. There was a real grievance here that the people were being taxed too heavily. So Rehoboam comes to the throne, and he immediately faces a question that perhaps a more experienced man would have had better judgment to face. And look what happens. He gets conflicting advice. 1 Kings 12, verses 6 and 7. 1 Kings 12, verses 6 and 7. What am I to do, Rehoboam asks his advisors. Always a good thing to ask advisors, but you've got to ask the right ones. 1 Kings 12, verse 6. The point being you're going to lose a big chunk of the nation if you don't do the right thing here. Verse 6, King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon, men older than him, no doubt, while he still lived, and he said, how do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, 
then they will be your servants forever. And he kind of wished the story stopped there. Kind of wished Rehoboam had turned to them and said, great ideas, guys. That's what I'm going to do. Because it would have changed history, wouldn't it? Nope, that's not what he did. Verse, verse 10, he turns to the young men and he asks them, and they give him very bad advice. The young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, thus you should speak to this people who have spoken to you. Your father made our yoke heavy, referring to the taxation burden, the corvée, as they call it, in the, in the, uh, the scholars refer to it. But you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, my little finger will be thicker than my father's waist. Great advice, guys. No, it was actually terrible advice. Verse 11, and now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions, as it says literally in the Hebrew. I'm going to sting you like scorpions. I'm the boss around here, don't you know? Uh, well, that is not always the best way to deal with situations of this kind. Who had the good judgment? Who had the good judgment? Of course, Solomon before him did. Solomon had asked for wisdom at the beginning of his reign in another important transition. But if Rehoboam had taken the advice of the elders, it would have changed history. Would the nation still have split? Well, perhaps so. If it was God's purpose that it was to take place, I suppose it could have been postponed. But that's not the point. He had the option. He went down the wrong road. He got a bad decision. Good judgment takes experience. Good judgment takes time. Young people, if you aspire to serve God's church, it's important to, if you'll use, uh, pardon me using the technical term, the computer term, to download older folks. <laughs> Let's download our elders. Let's learn from them and from their experience. Uh, talking to people who serve, talking to people who've been around. They gain experience from the way they've done things. I think this is well understood in families. You know, families will often say that that first child is a challenge because there are things that they learn in raising the first child that are not so hard because they, you know, the road has been trod when the second child comes along and the third child. There's no way around it. We learn from experience, and this goes for leadership as well. We must learn from experience. We all must. We all must learn from experience, and I believe one of the great facets of true leadership is to take advice and to take input from uh, those who have experience in different areas of life, different from ours. We had that this week with the strategic planning going on in the office. Now let's take a quick look at the other side. Let's look at people who are further along in life, who, what they need to do in cooperating with younger people so that the generation to generation effect works well. I found a wonderful quote from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar about his retirement from the NBA and what he said about this. This is the quote, he said, the transition was difficult it's hard to stop something that you've enjoyed and has been very rewarding. There are times when people hold on a little too long. I remember a member of the faculty of Ambassador College, a gentleman I knew quite well, who used to talk about his experience on one of the campuses of Ambassador College. And um, he, uh, he talked about the fact that they used to have a barbecue at the orientation every year. And the same individual did the barbecue year after year after year. And at one point, this individual was approached and they would say, well, why don't you let somebody else do the barbecue, grill the, the meat for the barbecue for the faculty and for the students? And his reaction was very defensive. I've been doing this for years and nobody is going to take it out of my hands. And of course, that's the wrong way to approach these things because there are times when changes serve God's people best. Remember what we said at the beginning of the sermon, the goal is always to do what's in the best interest of the church. Um, the example of Joshua. Joshua comes in with a new energy level. He's the one who leads Israel to conquer the promised land. It was not Moses who did that. But let's look at a negative example here. Um, it's also a complicated history. But the transition from Saul to David was a fascinating thing. 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And I want to read verses 6 through 9. 1 Samuel 18. Verses 6 through 9. There's a lot to be said again. This is one of these very rich transitions in the Bible. There's a lot that goes on here. Uh, Saul, the man who started out with everything on his side, 
We're told he was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was good looking and capable. A lot to be commented here. But I want to fa focus on just one particular aspect of it. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 6 through 9. Here we've got David's star ascending and Saul's star beginning to descend. And look at what uh, takes place here. It happened as they were coming home from a battle when David was, re was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, joy, with musical instruments. And the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul is listening to it and he has a very human reaction. Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him and he said, they've ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they've ascribed only thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that time forward. Uh, of course, God had chosen David. This was God's purpose, that David would be king over Israel. When Samuel went to visit Jesse, he knew whom God was seeking. It was his purpose. But Saul resented him. You remember what takes place after that, the, uh, the javelins and one thing and another, uh, all of those things that take place. It's not the way that uh, transitions ought to be done. A positive example, that as we move forward into the New Testament, involves John the Baptist. I've always been impressed with what John the Baptist did. Let's go forward to John chapter 3. John 3, in the New Testament. You ever think about John the Baptist? In a sense, the New Testament era had not even begun yet. 400 years of pause from the time that the Old Testament era had ended and here's the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. And he perhaps only even partially understood his own commission. He's preparing the way of Jesus Christ. Again, it's a complicated and fascinating transition as John the Baptist has to be even reassured at certain points about who it is who's come. Now, he knew the Old Testament scriptures, but he had to be certain of it. But when he was sure of the transition, in John 3 and verse 30, well, let's pick it up here in verse 28. So let's read a little bit more than just that one verse. Uh, John 3 and verse 28, he says to the disciples, his disciples, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He was delighted. He was the one who prepared the way for Jesus Christ at his first coming. And then this fascinating verse, which always grabs my attention in verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. And there comes a time for all leaders when that's the case, when somebody else needs to take the leadership. And of course, the big question is always going to be, what's in the best interests of the church? What's best for the church in modern times? I remember Richard Pennelly when we were in, in Cincinnati and uh, he was talking about this particular subject. I went to a feast about uh, 10, 12 years ago and he got all of the elders together and he talked to the elders and he talked to them about the importance of preparing new leaders and being ready to relinquish some of the responsibilities. Some let these things go, don't they? You know, well, it's time. I'm ready. Now, others sometimes hold on rather tightly. Um, one of the responsibilities of the older is to teach and prepare the next generation and then being willing to relinquish it, like John the Baptist here. Now, before finishing the sermon, I want to uh, touch on a particular subject that I think is really rather important, and it's something that's come up in the church within the last few years. It's a slightly sensitive subject, but I think it needs to be mentioned in the context of a sermon on this subject. What something that gets said occasionally among the young people goes a little bit along these lines. Well, we've sat and we've watched everything that's taken place in the church, and we've seen how the old guys have, well, made a mess of it. This is what gets said. It gets said privately, and I think many of us know this. The old guys have made a mess of things, and when we're in charge, we will do it all better. And in particular, the claim that is made occasionally so I think perhaps a little bit more frequently than maybe we'd even care to admit. Once, we've, once we're in charge, we'll bring everybody back together. We'll reunite the church of God. They messed it up. 
we'll heal the breach. And that is being said um, at times. I'd like to talk about that briefly because, of course, the goal of reuniting the church is a wonderful thing. I would love to see that. I would love to see that. I'd love to be there when that happens, if that happens. John 17, verse 23, it is a wonderful goal. It's a high and fine goal to have. John 17, verse 23. Let's look at the scripture. I think we're familiar with this scripture. Uh, all of John chapter 17 is about unity. It's about God's people, about them being together. And this one verse in John 17, verse 23, it's always so striking when we sit there in the spring every year at Passover time, and I look at this scripture and think, you know, this was Jesus Christ's dying wish, that we would be one. John 17, verse 23. Jesus says, I in them and you in me, praying to the Father, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And he goes on to pray that we would be made one. That word one jumps out at you when you read John chapter 17. And so, if it ever happens, no, not if, when it happens, it's going to be a wonderful thing. At some point in the future, God's people will hopefully be reunited, and I think it will be a very, very good thing. So the goal of reunifying the church of God is a very, very good goal. And maybe it is possible that at some point in the future, people who are young and sitting in the congregations now, perhaps they will be able to affect that. But I would offer one a couple of cautionary comments here, that if and when that ever happens, it will be very important for those who affect that to understand the history of the church during our lifetime. Most of us sitting here were baptized in another organized body of people. The day I was baptized, I was absolutely determined that the Worldwide Church of God was my home until the time Jesus Christ came back from heaven. I won't ask for a show of hands, but many, most of you will echo the same sentiment. This is where I stay, and I'm not leaving this church until Christ comes back from heaven. And the day I was baptized, I and you could not foresee what was going to happen in the intervening years. The things that have taken place in the intervening years have involved matters of principle. They've involved matters of principle. And if God's church is ever to be reunited, it must be reunited on matters of principle. What are those matters of principle? The matters of principle are number one, purity of doctrine. I see people now these days, I was out in Big Sandy a couple of weeks ago and we had a dinner out there on the Saturday night and there are people there, fine, nice people, friendly people, but people who don't believe or practice the same way as us any longer. You know, you've got friends who are in the same camp. We don't have the same faith in common any longer. And the other consideration, the very important one, is integrity of leadership and that must never ever be diluted in the church. So if and when, and I really do hope it's when and not if, if there is ever a reunification of the church, it would have to take place on the basis of those considerations and those criteria. For young people, often, not always, but often going to church on the Sabbath is very social. Not wrong to want to go to church and worship with your friends. We all like to do that. But the social must never overcome the spiritual. We're here because of spiritual reasons. We're here because Jesus Christ is here. And those of us who've been through an awful lot went through what we went through because of reasons of principle. I, we don't expect the violins to play at this point. That's not the point. I'm not asking for violins to play in the background because you could all have violins playing in the background as well. The membership could, as well as, those, as, well as the ministry and as well as people uh, who, who work for the church. The point that I'm making here is that it's a wonderful goal. But if it ever takes place in the future, and may it take place under the leadership perhaps of another generation of leaders, if it ever takes place in the future, it will be necessary to understand why the divisions came about in the first place in order to be, to be able to retrace the steps with some, I would say some. Because when you look around and you look at some of those who are Sabbath keepers, and you look at some of the beliefs that have come in among the Sabbath people, keeping people of God, you say to yourself, could we ever reunify with them? I don't know. There are some things we have to leave in the hands of Jesus Christ, and uh, perhaps at some point in the future, he will offer an opportunity. 
But those factors will be very important. If the spirit is wrong, it won't succeed. If the spirit is wrong, it won't succeed. But I think we would all love to see that at some point in the future. Something for us to keep in mind. In any case, for God's people, there must be a chain of leadership that mustn't be broken. We know from the scriptures that the church of God will continue, but the desire is that God's church will continue in a way that's smooth and harmonious and provide a good home for God's people and accomplish the work of the church. A couple of scriptures wrap it up here in Matthew 16, verse 18. Matthew 16 and verse 18. Christ tells us for sure the church will continue. That's not the question. The question is, are we going to be part of that continuity in the right way? Matthew 16, verse 18. Speaking to Peter, Jesus Christ says, And I say to you that you are Peter, you know this scripture, and on this rock, referring to himself, I will build my church, and the gates of the grave will never prevail against it. And we've been through some times that have been difficult. We've been through some rocky and unstable times. But Jesus Christ's promise remains, and it, the great gates of the grave will never prevail against God's church. Finally, Matthew 28 and verse 20. Matthew 28 and verse 20. Christ's purpose will be fulfilled. We all want to be in tune with him. Matthew 28 and verse 20. Right at the end of the Great Commission, look at the way he phrases it here, just interrupting the context. He describes our work, and then he talks about what we're to do with the disciples who come along, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And then he says with this wonderful flourish at the end of the Great Commission, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the work of the church is going to continue with young and old, male and female, people who are in different walks of life, working together, providing for leadership, providing for service in the church. And our desire for all of us, I believe, is to be a part of that.